Kutzkadum. I'm from the Quetzal Nation in Fort Yuma, California. I was born at this magical place called the Phoenix Indian Medical Center that's a part of Indian Health Services. If you all thought the VA was bad, you haven't been to Indian Health Services. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm Native American, maybe the first one some of you have seen outside of TV, maybe the first time you've heard one speak. But I didn't always know I was Native. You see, I was born and raised in a predominantly white neighborhood where I was easily, easily the darkest kid among everybody in that group. And given that I was the darkest kid I had ever seen in my entire life, when kids started asking about my identity at school, I responded in my eight-year-old naiveness, well, I'm black. <laughs> <laughs> and my teacher overheard me, and she called my mom. And when I got home from school, my mom, she, she saw me, she said, JD, sit down, I have something to tell you. <laughs> She said, J.D., you're not black. <laughs> and I got sad because I had, I had thoroughly enjoyed being African-American the first eight years of my life. <laughs> but I looked to my mom and I said, Mom, well, what am I? And she said, J.D., you're Native American. You're, you're Quetzal. And my eyes lit up again. And almost as soon as she told me, I took my shirt off. I got her red lipstick, started painting my face and my chest. I cut up her hibiscus tree and I started making bows and arrows and hunting the alley cats in our backyard. I did everything that I saw and what I thought it meant to be Native, you know, or at least the perception, but in reality, I realized that the visibility of Natives in the world was just so limited. You know, the work I do is to bring visibility to Native Americans through data. You know, more specifically, I use quantitative data to tell our stories through a universal language of numbers. You see, most of the information about us is limited to whatever seen in Western movies, as well as mascots. But you see, natives have inhabited these lands for longer than the U.S. has been around, and currently we represent about, you know, 2% of the U.S. population. But you see, to some, visibility doesn't matter, but when half of indigenous women experience domestic violence, when 96% of those perpetrators are non-native, and when 67% of sexual abuse cases are denied by the U.S. Attorney's Office, then visibility matters. You see, when we want to pass policies, but the data is not there, or there's not a large enough sample to find statistical significance, then visibility matters. When we are co constantly have these stereotypical images of us, but we just want people to recognize that we're here strong and resilient in the modern world, then visibility matters. You know, my work, it's to help build the tribal capacity of many of our nations. And you know, I do it through two different ways. The first part is collecting and analyzing data, and that the second part of that is helping tribes use that data to figure out ways to improve the rate of Native Americans going into higher education. You see, currently the rate of Native Americans going into higher education is quite low, compared to other groups, that is. We have about 12% of Native Americans compared to 37% of white students complete at least a bachelor's degree. So as a researcher, one of the things that I'm really concerned with is how do we improve the rate of Native Americans going into higher education? And one of the things that we have found is that culture can predict persistence. But what does that really mean? Like, what tangible things can we get from that? And so as a tribe, we've worked together in thinking about ways that we could support our students culturally. And one of the things we've come up with is, well, maybe we need to buy real estate near the universities that our students are more likely to, to attend. You see, in almost building a home away from home. Like, for example, right now we have seven of our students that go to an in-state university. We pay $10,000 to a university that, that doesn't necessarily support them per student. So that's 70 grand a year. Why aren't we using that capital to buy real estate that, where we could support our students? We could give them the cultural support they need. They could be around other natives, have the language, have the food, people that talk like them, smell like them. But really, we're also, moreover, building the economic development of our tribe. And we're also helping these students build legacies for the families and communities. And when I talk about legacies, I can't help but think about my own family. You see, my mom, she's 65 years old, and I hope she doesn't mind I said that. <laughs> but, you know, my mom, she grew up in a one-bedroom mud house in the middle of the Sonoran Desert. Because of the boarding school era, her home was racked with alcohol and abuse. You know, her father passed away of alcohol poisoning just outside their sandwich home beneath the mesquite tree when she was 12 years old. In that same year, a group of Native American college students came to our reservation 
with a message of hope through education. And they told my mom, you could go to college. And my mom, at the age of 12, she believed them. And she effectively changed the legacy of our family. But the thing is, is there wasn't data or anything to tell her story. And so what I want for future generations is with the certainty of numbers that they can know that they could help change the legacies of their families also. You see, visibility, it matters. It matters to all 573 federally recognized tribes and even more state-recognized tribes. It matters to the Sinaboy and the Arapaho, the Apache, to the Chimaweve, to the Comanche, the Cherokee, to the Wallapai, the Havasupai, and the Hopi, to the Mohawk, the Macaw, and the Muckleshoot, to the Quetzans, to the Pawnee, to the Paiute, it matters to the Hona Atam, the Yaki, and the Zuni. You see, the data represents people, and those people, our people's stories, need to be visible. Thank you.